Hi, Genies. It's Fisher. Before we get started, just a quick thank you for getting Extreme Genes to where it is today. We're on radio stations all over America, and our podcast is growing exponentially. I'm often asked, what can I do to support Extreme Genes? Well, that's easy. Become a part of our Extreme Genes Facebook community and like our page. Share the podcast with your friends. Follow us on Twitter. And most importantly, support our sponsors through links on our website. They're the best in the business. Thanks again. Now let's get on to this week's podcast. Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma, Pig Sloppin', in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher. I am your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Well, coming up for you here in just a little bit, we're going to bring Stan Lindis back from HeritageConsulting.com talking about this study he discovered to give you the answer to that question that everybody always asks anybody who's in the family history. Why do you do this stuff? Well, there's a real practical reason for it, and, and wait till you hear the benefit. It's unbelievable stuff. Stan will have that for you in about eight minutes. Then, later in the show, perhaps the most outrageous family history story that I've ever heard involving a, a man's wife's relative who died in the early 20th century and whose body went on a journey all of its own for the next 66 years. You will not believe what he has to say. So we'll get to that a little bit later on. But first, it is time to check in with Boston and the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, David Allen Lambert. How are things in Beantown, bud? I'm glad to be back home, but it was lovely to be out in Salt Lake City. Yes, you were researching. Did you have a good experience? I had an amazing experience. You know, I've been going out there for over 20 years, and it always amazes me that I come back from the Family History Library with something. The thing about my ancestry, I mean, I do a lot of my New England stuff, obviously, back home, but I have a grandfather from England, and I know I'm English, and I've got Irish on my dad's side, but I have a new ethnicity. Really? Mm -hmm. I don't know what holiday I have to celebrate, and maybe one of the (laughs) listeners can tell me. But in 1765, my fifth great-grandfather, Randall Wilkinson, married Martha Cartwright, and they were married in Bangor, Flintshire, Wales. So I'm partly Welsh. And you didn't know this? I didn't know it. My DNA didn't tell me that I was Welsh. So sometimes the research will pan out. The nice thing about it is the next time I watch Bonanza, I'll be able to say, you know, the Cartwright family, have, I have a connection. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the other thing that I thought was great, and I think we've chatted about it before, but I never had gone myself. The Discovery Center that Family Search has is amazing. Yes, it is. It's, it's almost like Disneyland for family history if you have contributed especially things to FamilySearch.org. Exactly. And I have put a lot of the photographs that I have in of my ancestors, and I put it back about five or six generations. I was amazed to see it come up on a screen and then they show you geographically where your name is distributed and how many times your last name shows up in the United States. But the time machine was amazing. Yes. I just selected my grandmother, who was born in 1896, and all of a sudden the living room of the kitchen, the room that in front of us, transformed digitally back to 1896, like I was traveling back in time. It, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I wish my kids were there to experience it. I think now that I've had this experience, one of my kids would probably say, yeah, Dad, let's go and uh, travel in the time machine to Salt Lake City. <laughs> Great call. The Family History News, the thing that's the headline is from Find My Past. Now, Find My Past has been really great with releasing a lot of English records and American records, but this week they released the 1939 Register. Wow. Before? 
No, I hadn't realized that because I'm a little confused because they always do it like on the, uh, the, the, the first year after the change of decade. So 1901, 1911, 1921. Why 1939? Well, this isn't really a census. It was a register that was taken to record 41 million people. With the outbreak of World War II, they sent over 65,000 enumerators around 16 million households, recorded every person, their occupation, and their exact date of birth so they could keep track of them in case they had to evacuate people. I mean, the brink of World War II was right upon them, and I think they were trying to figure out how they could keep track of everyone. Now, the, the tough thing for genealogists will be, Currently, the 1911 census is available. Right. The 1921 census won't be released until 2022. Right, 101 years later. This 1939 register is going to represent the only census, if you will, for the 1930s, because the 31 census was destroyed from the bombings in World War II. Right, and they in didn't 19- do one in 41? Correct. In 1941, they were at the height of the war, so they didn't. So they will not have another census release until 2052, when the 1951 census is 101 years old. We'll talk about that one when Family <laughs> History News in 2052 comes up, our hologram yes, edition. Yes, exactly. All right, what else do you have? Well, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was another World War II-related item, but here back in the United States, NPR has compiled a database of over 3,900 individuals that were exposed to mustard gas unbeknownst to them. So veterans, there's a free database, and we'll have the link for it available on the Extreme Genes Facebook page and also on Twitter. The story of were your relatives exposed to mustard gas will allow you to search a free database by the name of the veteran, the last known residents, their service, and when they were born, enlisted, and in some cases when they died. I didn't even know that in World War II that they would be experimenting on our service like this, but this is apparently... Ooh, that's ugly. Yes. So this was all part of an experiment. Apparently so. Oh. And I, it, you know, it's sad you hear about all the ones that were gassed in the Argonne Forest in World War One. Right. <sighs> Experimenting on chemical warfare, but they started compiling this database back in 1993 when officials from the Department of Veterans Affairs told the agency they were trying to locate the test subjects. Some of them still living? Some of them are probably still living, so I think it's important to our listeners by searching on your own ancestor or people in your community. I searched for one in my hometown and found a fellow who died in 1981. I'm very anxious now to track down his family and say, are you aware that your dad was hit by mustard gas? And maybe there's some compensation that can be done. It's part of history, and uh, unfortunately, we learn from the shadows of the past things that happened many years later. Sad stuff. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was the tech tip uh, of the week, and that would be to use color in your genealogy. That's kind of fundamental, but boy, it's important, isn't it? It is. I mean, if you separated out the thumb drives that you have, one thumb drive for each one of your grandparents' families, and made a color sticker on it or to color code each one of the thumb drives, that would be important. The other thing that you could do is you can color code your file folders or even the separators that you use or digitally make colored folders on your computer. That way, maybe your maternal side grandfather is blue, your paternal grandmother is pink, your maternal grandfather is green, and your maternal maternal grandmother is orange. That way you can quickly grab the things that you need or grab the right thumb drive. It's a real simple little tip, but I think that people will find it useful, uh, yep. especially when their genealogical toolkit is on the road. It can be high tech or low tech. Exactly. And the free guest user database from AmericanAncestors.org is the United States 1910 Census Index. So you can use this to uh, help search for your family in 1910 in the United States. And this is one of the collaborations that we have with FamilySearch.org. Great stuff. All right, David, thank you for joining us. Catch you next week. And coming up next, we'll talk to a man whose wife's relative went on quite a journey that lasted 66 years after he died. <laughs> Wait till you hear this. You'll be telling this story to your friends, I promise. It's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Hi, Genies. It's Fisher. So excited to tell you about our very first Extreme Genes Family History Cruise, September 13th through 18th, 2016. We'll be leaving out of Boston on Royal Caribbean with stops in Bar Harbor, Maine, St. John, New Brunswick, and Halifax, Nova Scotia. On days we're at sea, join me and David Allen Lambert, Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org for lectures and roundtables on several genealogical topics. See where your patriot ancestors fought in the revolution or where your loyalist ancestors claimed their new homes for pricing go to our extreme genes facebook page or visit extremegenes.com now is the time to make your reservations because when the cabins are gone they're gone call robin at columbus travel at 1-800-373-3328 extension 1010 and be sure to ask her about our special pre-cruise excursion in boston david and i look forward to seeing you here it comes, the 6th Annual Roots Tech Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah, February 3rd through 6th, 2016, at the Salt Palace Convention Center. The conference, hosted by Family Search International, is the largest family history and technology conference in the world. This year's theme will be celebrating families across generations. It's the perfect place to be inspired to discover, preserve, and share family connections and stories across generations, past, present, and future. At Roots Tech, you'll find some 200 engaging classes with experts from all over the world. Enjoy daily sessions with well-known key keynote speakers and learn all about the new tools available to help you in your journey in the massive exhibition hall. Passes start at $29. For more information and to register, visit rootstech.org. Hope to see you February 3rd through 6th in Salt Lake City, Utah. And welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, the radio root sleuth, with my good friend Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com. Stan, good to see you again. It's been a bit. Hey, I know. You just love me enough to keep bringing me back. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, the, one question we all get as uh, researchers and genealogists and storytellers is, why do we do this stuff? So I'll ask you, why do you do family history research? I could say I do it to upset other people, but the reality is that I do it because I'm frankly addicted to addicted. it. Addicted. Yeah. yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I myself yeah. have come to my senses. And, and, oh, <laughs> it's a yeah, genealogy that, that is, joke. That's sad. It's um, really bad. But here is a good explanation to give back to people of the true real-life benefits of doing family yeah, history research. I mean, in, in all things, there's practical reasons for doing stuff. And most of us can't come up with a practical reason for doing family history and genealogy. I have brothers that look at me and go, I know you like this, but don't ever talk to me about it. You know? <laughs> um, I, and I can't quite comprehend it. You know, I've come back from the battlefield and Andersonville and uh, stuff like that. He doesn't want to talk about it. But there are some real practical reasons for doing it. We talk about leaving heritage for our family and our children, but it's even more than that. Back in 2000, there was a young lady who had gone to her family reunion, the obligatory attendance thing. Mm -hmm. and in the course of the Do day... Do I have to go, Mom? Pretty much, and once you get there, well... Her niece was being somewhat of a pain, considerably lower than the neck. Uh-oh. And she corrected the child, 
which brought the ire of her sister upon her. Uh Uh-oh. And so it became the Hollywood version of a family reunion. Um, (laughs) The mess. Yeah, Yeah. the mess. Uh Well, that evening, her father called her into his bedroom, and she sat down on the side of the bed lamenting, my family is just crumbling, it's all going away. And she was thinking about it, and she got to talking to a friend of hers, a Dr. Duke at Emory University. Well, Dr. Duke's wife worked with the handicapped children, and she had noticed in her observation of working with these kids that those children who could tell stories about their family were able to handle their handicap situation far better than the others. Really? And yeah, and Dr. Duke thought, that's interesting. And so he and a colleague set up a study where they had looked at adolescents and they had two groups. One group knew nothing about their ancestors, none of the stories, good, bad, or indifferent. And the other had a fairly complete knowledge of stories about their parents, their grandparents, great-grandparents. They created a battery of tests and in the process of asking these questions, they realized that the children who had a knowledge of their ancestral stories had a 70 plus percent better chance and ability to deal with the problems that beset them every day of their lives. Really? Yeah. Social problems that come to them, family problems. And part of the understanding that came out of this was that the kids that were equipped with stories about family had a better sense of self, but not a self in isolation, right. but a self in the context of a family and a support group. And Living and dead. Yes, both. Really? Both, yeah. And Dr. Duke basically said that there were three types of stories. And, you know, you and I, we push stories all the time. Sure. You more than me. But <laughs> the three types of stories that he looked at in this were ascending stories, stories about ancestors who ascended to greatness or to levels of success. Right. And then there were the descending stories about those who fell from grace, Ah, you know. Great-grandfather, yeah. Then the third group are the oscillating stories, the stories of ascending and declining and ascending and declining. In other words, a complete story as opposed to the obituaries that you read and everybody's a saint, that kind of a thing. So the children that had the stories of the oscillating nature were far, far more superior in being able to figure out that, yes, I made a mistake, but it's not the end of the world, and I don't have to face this by myself. And Fish, I'm telling you, if you can leave one thing to your children... Why not that? Give them the ability to deal with today's problems better than if you didn't give them the gift. Sure, yeah. Fill their quiver with stories. Right. Fabulous stories. And And oscillating stories. Oscillating stories. And you can do it in ways, you you can set the kids down and say, okay, tonight we're going to tell stories. And they're (laughs) going to roll their eyes. But you can do it in so many different ways. With my family, I tell them stories. And then you can have a contest between my daughter's children and my son's children. Sounds like I'm starting a feud. And you say, here's the name of an ancestor, Herman Schmutzelfutz. The first one who can tell me what Herman was notorious for wins tickets to the baseball game or whatever. And and so it becomes a competition. And they don't even realize that they are engaged in this improvement of their social skills. Right. In this internalization. Yes, exactly. My daughter, when she was in sixth grade, they created books. She picked an ancestor, my great-grandmother from Norway, the immigrant, and she drew pictures of her great-great-grandmother and the ship she came over on, the house in Norway, the house over here, and then they bound the book. She cherishes that book to this day. Sure. And not just her, but her nieces and nephews. They love that book. You can teach these kids. And I can't think of a better reason for me doing genealogy. You know? You're absolutely right. And talk about a practical solution. Yeah. I would wish that I could have known this earlier on. So when somebody said, what are you doing? Why do you even care? You know, I could have given them an answer better than, oh, I just like this. Yeah. You know, you know, it's fun. <laughs> absolutely. It's fun. Yeah. I mean, a little bit later in the show here, we're going to talk about a guy whose wife's relative died Back at the early part of the 20th century, and the body was later mistaken to be a wax figure. It was never buried. 
and, and you're going to hear this incredible journey. And I'm thinking, boy, that, that might actually mess some kids up <laughs> when they hear about this one. But that's yeah. coming up here in about six or seven minutes. Yeah, it, it's a great story. Yes, I've, it is. I've, I've heard that story. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I would uh, exhort everybody, tell the stories. Tell the stories. Have fun telling the stories. All right, so question for you. Have you found some new stories lately, something that interests you? Yeah, it's not a typical case. I got a call from a representative of one of the major tobacco companies. I know that's an evil word in today's society, but this is a tobacco company that has been around since the very early 1700s. And they have some pictures of emblems or insignias, and I'm supposed to try to find out if they are, in fact, trademarks. Wow. And so I've got researchers up at the university who specialize in trademark who are digging and scrounging. And in the process, they're learning the practical reasons why they had a snuff mill back and, in Delaware. And of course, this was the money crop for that North was America the back money then crop. for many of our ancestors. Yes. Snuff was discovered when Columbus came to America and they saw the Indians taking tobacco through wooden tubes and sucking it up into their noses. As a result, the manufacturing of snuff was done in Portugal and Spain, and then eventually got to England, and they touted it for all kinds of health reasons, that it would help with headaches and the plague and anything you can imagine. Then the tobacco was being grown in the colonies. It was being sent back to England and being processed, and then it'd be sent back to the U.S., and the colonists got to pay extra for the tobacco that they grew, plus a tax on top of it. And the shipping. And the shipping, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the interest in the trademark, though? I mean, if, if they don't even know it exists, why would anybody or, else uh, care to try to violate it? they are celebrating 200 years of being in business. Ah, and okay. And so that's why we are doing the research on snuff. Fascinating um, stuff. Mills. When people acquired land and property, if they got a homestead, they were to improve on the property. And one of the things that the government wanted them to do was to build mills on the streams, a mill for doing lumber, taking care of grain, the wheat and the corn, and the tobacco. It was required that every 20 miles there should be a mill so that it would be accessible to those who were farming and that it was improving the area. And by having a mill, it would bring in more settlers. And by having more settlers, there were less of a need for the government to provide troops to protect from the Indians, the British, and the French on the frontier. Because they could create their own militias. Exactly. So basically, the government had a freestanding army without having to pay for it. You can't take the history out of family history, can no, you, Stan? No, no. Stan Lindis from Heritage Consulting. Always good to have you on the show. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Gary Nielsen about his wife's relative who passed in the early 20th century and then literally was passed from carnival to carnival until it was discovered exactly who he was and what the state of his being was. Fascinating stuff. It's coming up in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks.
Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. And we are back. Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, the radio root sleuth. And we're always looking for your outlandish stories. And I'm just amazed by the ones we find. <laughs> and we have Gary Nielsen on the phone right now. And uh, Gary, you found out something about one of your wife's relatives lately that just kind of blows my mind. It blew my mind, too, when I heard about this one. So tell us a little about this. Did this involve some research or was there oral history that you got into? How did you find out about it? Well, my wife's sister married a gentleman, Byron McCurdy. We had a little uh, game that we played when he married into the family called Two Truths and a Lie. Okay. And this was one of his, we thought was a lie. He said, well, I'm related to a guy that was shot in 1911. He was a bank robber and a train robber, and he was a kind of a bumbling idiot. Got shot. His body ended up getting embalmed, and he went crisscrossed the country for 65 years on display. <laughs> it ended up in a haunted spook house at an amusement park. And we were like, yeah, right. Okay, that's definitely the lie. Yeah. And we were all wrong. It was true. It was and true. So I got very interested in this story. And I thought, you know, I'm going to look into this on this Elmer J. McCurdy. Elmer McCurdy. Okay, now where was he from? What era did he live? Tell us about him. He was in Oklahoma. He was born in 1880 and died in 1911, so just about 31 years old when he was shot in the Oklahoma Territory. And he was dubbed the bandit who would never give up. And he actually had robbed a train that was supposed to have a large payroll on it. He robbed the wrong train, got a few dollars, a bunch of whiskey. He went to a barn and started drinking and got drunk, and that's where he got tracked down and was shot and killed. Okay, so now what happened with the corpse? So they took the corpse to a local mortician. He embalmed the body and was waiting for the next of kin to come and claim the body, and nobody ever came. Hmm. And so he said, well, i got to make money to pay for the embalming. So he put up Elmer McCurdy's body in the mortuary, charged a nickel, and people could take a look at this guy's dead body. And he ended up making a fair amount of money on this. <laughs> My gosh. For how long? Um, it was about four years. Oh. <laughs> four years, yeah. Then two gentlemen came that said that they were his next of kin. James and Charles Patterson, they were two brothers. He gave them the body. The Patterson brothers ended up putting him back on display in a carnival show. Oh, no. Traveling around the country. <laughs> they ended up uh, taking him around, called him the embalmed bandit, the outlaw who would never be captured alive. So you're saying that the two brothers that came were not related to him at all? They were not. No. Nope. Oh they just boy. Knew about it, and they realized they could make money with this guy's body. They kept him until 1922, when Patterson he sold his operation to a uh, Louis Sony. Okay. And then uh, Louis Sony ended up keeping the corpse, and he actually traveled that corpse around in a show called Museum of Crime. <laughs> And that also included wax replicas of the famous outlaws like uh, Bill Doolin and Jesse James. And clear through 1928, the corpse was part of the official sideshow that accompanied the Trans-American foot race. So are, are most of the people who are seeing this body in this carnival, are they thinking that it's wax, perhaps? 
Yes, this is when they started thinking it was wax, even though the sign would say, no, this is a real body. Uh -huh. People started not believing that it was really a real body, even though it was shrinking, it was shriveled up. <laughs> he was looking worse and worse. Hmm. Yeah, it wasn't like weekend at Bernie's. No. <laughs> so what happened then? Now, you're 17 years out from his death. He's still on parade. We're approaching now the time of the Great Depression. Did he continue on? He did. And this was now 22 years after the embalming. The skin continued to shrivel. And uh, Louis Sony died in 1949. And so the corpse was placed in a storage unit in Los Angeles warehouse for 15 years. 15 more years. So now how far out are we? Okay, now we're in 1964. <laughs> so we're we're past a half a century here. Exactly. Yeah. And so Sony's son Dan, he lended the corpse to a filmmaker by the name of David F. Friedman, and it made a brief appearance in Friedman's 1967 film called She Freak. You people can watch that She Freak, and <laughs> sure enough, there's Alma McCurdy. Wow, so this was the late 60s. Yeah, and then in 1968, Dan Sony sold Elmer's body, along with several other wax figures, for $10,000 to Spoonie Sina, and he was the owner of the Hollywood Wax Museum. And, and he's thinking so wax, he, right? Yes, so he's thinking wax. He then sold those two figures to two fellow Canadian men. They had an exhibit that they took to Mount Rushmore. And so here was Elmer McCurdy along with some other wax figures at Mount Rushmore. <laughs> and, and again, this is 1968. Yeah. And that display was there for a couple of years. One of the things that happened, there's a windstorm that came up at Mount Rushmore and actually blew Elma McCurdy over. The wax figures stayed put. They were heavy. But he blew over. It broke off fingers and toes and, and broke off one of his ears. And I think most people thought, well, that's what happens to wax. It sure. break off when it tips over. Right. What happened at that point is they sold the body then to uh, Ed D. Lyrish, and he had space leased at the New Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California. These guys thought, well, this body will help get attention, and it will be something fun for people to come and see and, and hopefully enter into their book house. And it's book scary, house. right? Yes. <laughs> So they dressed Elmer in a black suit and laid him in a new casket that they built, and they displayed the corpse on the boardwalk in front of the haunted house ride. <laughs> and they, they operated that haunted house ride. They later topped the casket with glass because customers kept putting their things into Elmer's nose and in his mouth. <laughs> oh, <gee. laughs> and so they said, this is a thousand-year-old man. Right. And from 1972, the body was actually then confiscated because these two guys were not paying their rent for mm. their exhibit and their ride. And so then Elmer McCurdy went back into a closet, literally a coat closet, in one of the employees' apartments that worked in, and was oh. the owner of the New Pike Amusement Park. This is amazing. I mean, it just keeps it, going. <laughs> And as part of the display, he was he said, well, hey, I've got this old dead mannequin. And he said, well, I'm going to hang him from a noose, which he made a noose and hung it oh. from the rafters. He painted Elmer McCurdy's body in orange phosphorus paint. Then with a black light, when these little cars would come around on the track into that section, here was Elmer McCurdy's body all lit up and glowing with this orange phosphorus paint. And for several years... People just thought it was just a mannequin hanging from the rafters on oh, a hangman's noose. Unbelievable. In 1977, Six Million Dollar Man, the TV series, were filming a season four, episode 18, actually used Laugh in the Dark Funhouse, and they filmed while the park was still open. Well, one of the employees, he was curious why the guy's hands were where they were located. He went to move one of the hands, and the arm broke off. Uh-oh. He looked at that, and he said, my gosh, there's a bone in there. This <laughs> cannot be a wax figure. The mannequin would never have this. It's the real deal. It's the real deal. So he called the police and called the fire department. They came in and investigated and took him in for an autopsy. Wow. 
So the autopsy was completed, and the guy doing it, he realized that this mannequin had already had an autopsy. They actually found the bullet, and after a long time of, of research, they found out this is Elmer McCurdy, who was shot and killed back in Oklahoma. In 1911, and for 66 years was on display. Exactly. Wow. What a tale. <laughs> Indeed it is. What a saga. Gary Nielsen, thank you so much for sharing your tale. Oh, talk about skeleton in the closet. (laughs) Very nice finish there. All right. Thanks so much for coming on, Gary. Hey, thank you. And coming up next, it's Tom Perry, our Preservation Authority, talking about ways to preserve your priceless heirlooms on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, in three minutes. Hi, Genies. It's Fisher. So excited to tell you about our very first Extreme Genes Family History Cruise, September 13th through 18th, 2016. We'll be leaving out of Boston on Royal Caribbean with stops in Bar Harbor, Maine, St. John, New Brunswick, and Halifax, Nova Scotia. On days we're at sea, join me and David Allen Lambert, Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, for lectures and roundtables on several genealogical topics. See where your patriot ancestors ancestors fought in the revolution or where your loyalist ancestors claimed their new homes for pricing go to our extreme genes facebook page or visit extremegenes.com now is the time to make your reservations because when the cabins are gone they're gone call robin at columbus travel at 1-800-373-3328 extension 1010 And be sure to ask her about our special pre-cruise excursion in Boston. David and I look forward to seeing you. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Here it comes, the 6th Annual Roots Tech Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah, February 3rd through 6th, 2016, at the Salt Palace Convention Center. The conference, hosted by Family Search International, is the largest family history and technology conference in the world. This year's theme will be celebrating families across generations. It's the perfect place to be inspired to discover, preserve, and share family connections and stories across generations, past, present, present and future. At Roots Tech, you'll find some 200 engaging classes with experts from all over the world. Enjoy daily sessions with well-known keynote speakers and learn all about the new tools available to help you in your journey in the massive exhibition hall. Passes start at $29. For more information and to register, visit rootstech.org. Hope to see you February 3rd through 6th in Salt Lake City, Utah. All right, it's time to save you some money. It is preservation time on Extreme Genes, America's family history show. Fisher here. That is Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, the preservation authority. Hi, Tom. Hello. And last week we got started on a little alphabet soup and found we really couldn't get too far. And so we're going to continue that today. And this is kind of explaining some of the different formats and files and what do they mean so that even at a very basic level, you can learn to do some things that's going to save you money, time, and give you the opportunity to preserve some of the things that you treasure by yourself. 
All right, Tom, where do we pick up from last week? Okay, after last week's cliffhanger, we were talking about <laughs> MP3s, MP4s. If you missed last week's segment, I'd really suggest you go and download it and listen to it so you can kind of catch up to where we are. We finished talking about HDMI, how it's such an incredible device. You plug it into your Blu-ray player, plug it into your TV, and the audio and video is amazing. However, since it is so amazing, they built copyright issues into it so you can't plug it into a recorder and record stuff because right. you'd make digital copies of Disney movies, which is illegal and ethical, which is a whole other can of worms, which we don't want to get into. But for your own stuff, it's just really sad that you can't take a Blu-ray that you made of your old film and copy it onto something else. You've got to go in and do some editing, which we'll get into a little bit later. So that's the biggest problem with the HDMI, if you can call it a problem, or the restrictions, I guess, would be a better terminology for it. Then when we get into DVDs, people are confused too. They say, hey, I put this DVD in my computer and it's not a file. I go and look at it and it's shows it's a TS audio and a TS video. Rewind several years ago when DVDs first came out, the same thing is. It's like, wow, DVDs are so incredible. The video is all digital. It's so wonderful. We can't let people make copies of DVDs. (laughs) And that's why they did this? Exactly. So that's why it's written into two files, because you can't separate the two files and put them back together because they won't be in sync. You separate them, they're gone. People try to copy the two files to their desktop and then can't figure out why they don't play. They have to be in sync. There's special encoding that's involved with them. So when you actually make a DVD or as we call them, TS video, TS audio files, you can't separate them and make copies of them. You can duplicate a DVD, but you can't take the separate TS files and do anything with them. That's why you need to go to some kind of a program, which for years on the program, we've touted Cinematize, right. which got bought out by somebody that is not interested in consumer stuff. They're more into technology. And so they've never re-released Cinematize. If you can find an old copy on Amazon or any place, I suggest you get it. It's a great program to go into DVDs. You can go in and edit them. You can take stuff out, move things around. It's really nice. There's a shareware program that's basically free that's called Handbrake, which is about the only thing that's really good that's still out there. The only problem is it's very slow. However, if that's your only option, that's your only option. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about is we've had a lot of people write into us and say, hey, I just bought a new television and it doesn't have an S connector so I can plug my existing DVD player into it. Or I bought a new DVD player that doesn't have an S connector that I can plug into my current TV. What has happened with that? Well, basically, it was great. It was better than the old-fashioned cable, just a little yellow one. However, HDMI and RGB is so much better. In fact, RGB, which if you look at the back of high-end televisions, you'll see a little jack that's red, one that's green, and one that's blue. That's what RGB is. And that was always a professional format that the people on TV stations use. But now it's mainstream. It's so much better than S-Video. So people just thought, hey, most people are going to upgrade their DVD players or their televisions anyway. Let's just forget about the S-Connector. Let's still keep the old composite on, which is just your little teeny yellow cable. And let's go to RGB and HDMI because most people are going to need that. So they've thrown this video away. So you're not going to be able to find it. Don't worry about it. Upgrade to HDMI or RGB. Wow, there's a lot to process here, Tom. It's always changing. And we'll get into some more of these uh, basics of transferring digital material coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmasters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. 
When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. And we are back. Final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It is Fisher here, the Radio Root Sleuth. With Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. We're talking about all the changes going on in the common technology around us that can affect how we go about digitizing our family heirlooms, photographs, old movies and videos. And we're calling it alphabet soup so you can understand some of the formats. What are we going to talk about next, Tom? Okay, to try and put a closing segment together on stuff we talked about in the first segment and last week, the only things we haven't really covered is on a computer. There's a couple other formats we haven't talked about. We've talked about the quick times. Some people are still a little bit confused about AVIs. AVIs, when they first came out, were pretty much PC programs to edit video. MOVs were pretty much Macs. Now there's new software out there, such as PowerDirector, which will allow you to edit MOVs on AVIs. If you're strictly a PC user, you don't want to buy new equipment, you want to get an AVI. The disadvantage to AVIs is they're really, really big files. That's the nice thing about MOVs is they're small files, but yet they're better quality than an AVI. So if you can get your PC to edit an MOV by buying PowerDirector, you want to get MOVs. If you have a Mac, you always want to edit MOVs. Now, people start getting into WAV files. Well, what are WAV files? WAV files are different kinds of audio files. They're kind of outdated really now because most people are going to the mp3 because it's such an easy format anybody can use them then some people say well the only thing i have on my pc is windows movie maker because it comes free it's a okay program to do editing on but the thing is once you make a dvd it's only going to play on pcs it's not going to play on a dvd player blu-ray player or a mac wow that's kind of limited oh it is it's very limited and that's one thing i really like about power director it's only 50 bucks to buy it it uses all different kinds of formats So whether you're a PC user or whatever, you can still use your MOVs and make good quality edits, but also they're compressed enough that you can send them off. Plus, if you have an MOV and it's still a little bit too big, like you made like a two-hour video, you can still compress it into an MP4 to put on YouTube and still going to look really, really good. So there's a lot of flexibility with that. I think PowerDirector is probably the smartest thing that ever came out for a PC. And if you're on a Mac, iMovie's great because iMovie will let you export it into different kinds of things. There's different kinds of compressions. But the biggest things you want to end up with nowadays is try to get things in MP3s or MP4s because that way you're going to be compatible with just about anybody in the world. And once somebody has an MP3 or an MP4, they're going to be able to edit it. They're going to be able to do different things with it. They're good quality, but they're still small enough that you can email them. And Tom, lessons on how to use all this stuff is really pretty readily available online, right? For people who might be intimidated by all of this. Oh, absolutely. Google has gotten so amazing over the years. You can type almost anything into Google and something's going to come up. Even if it's just Wikipedia, that's going to kind of give you an idea of what this thing is. If you're looking at something that says, this will edit this, 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 and this, and you don't know what they're talking about, just go into Google and type in that word, and it'll bring up a Wikipedia or some kind of thing that's going to tell you this is what that means. We have people that bring in DVDs or call us with DVDs and says, hey, this DVD says it's a dot X, Y, Z. What does that mean? Just type that into a Google search window, and it'll come on and tell you exactly what it is. So you can say, 
Oh, this is why it doesn't play on my DVD player. This is only for use in a PC using such and such a program. So Google is absolutely wonderful. And like we've talked before, when you have all these files, if you want to share them with your friends, if they're too big, get something like Dropbox or go to our website. And we have a cloud that's called Lightjar, which gives you all kinds of editing tools. It's not just a storage device. It'll help you do all kinds of editing. But there are so many options out there nowadays that you can do everything yourself, even if you're not this crazy computer know-it-all. All right. Great stuff, Tom. Thanks for coming on. And if you have a question for Tom Perry, you can email him at asktom at tmcplace.com. See you next week. We'll be here. That wraps it up for this week. Thanks once again to Stan Lindis from Heritage Consulting for joining us and talking about this amazing new study that talks about all the benefits of kids' involvement in family history. Catch the podcast if you missed it. Thanks also to Gary Nielsen for talking about his wife's relative whose body was on display in carnivals for 66 years after his life of crime ended with a gunshot. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.